Hi everybody, time for another midweek chat. It is April, it's April, it's April. We had the, Sunday was the 21st, April 24th. So happy April 24th to everybody. Uh, you can see I uh, am at the temple, it says Temple Shalom. Um, so happy Passover. It's uh, it's the Passover, you know, our Easter, um, fluctuates so much the date you know it can be between like march 21st and april 22nd passover is similar and, and our easter kind of comes from the jewish calendar uh so anyway that would be a nice little background we can remember the high feast day here of uh feast i can i i wish i knew more i'm going to speak a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of ignorance so i apologize in advance um but uh i thought since it was the the passover week and that we're in the midst of culminating i think next monday evening when most people will have the seder meal the passover meal with the bitter herbs and the lamb shank and the egg and the green vegetable and that ordered meal um a little bit more on that later but uh so happy passover to uh to all the jewish people in the world celebrating that movement from slavery to freedom the days of moses so a little more on that later. We'll start. I just kind of knock off some Paris news before I forget. Um, so 20, 29 units, not of housing, but I need a haircut. I, I'm in that in-between state. Do I need a haircut? Yeah, probably. But it'll, anyway. Um, got one scheduled for next week. Um, 29 units of blood the blood drive that we had last week so uh at saint james so uh, ann always gives her uh life to those blood drives and she was happy to say we collected 29 units um last time the machine broke when she was giving blood and so her <laughs> efforts to give i think she was going to give power reds or something so it didn't even get used which was a shame um so hopefully it went better for her and the red cross this time uh Hey, last week was our first communions. So I got a lot of positive comments from families and just from parishioners. They said, well, we like to see the first communion. The kids look great in their white dresses and suits. And um, I love bringing them around the altar for the Eucharistic prayer. And I believe, you know, I'm praying, I'm not like monitoring how they're behaving, but I'm pretty sure they were quite reverent around the altar. And uh, the only thing I tell them right before we start the prayer is when I bow, you bow. Uh, and so that's, that's a beautiful thing. I like, I like uh, when our Eucharistic ministers come out after purifying the vessels, our weekend masses, and we kind of line up in front of the altar and bow. And that, that's very, uh, that's meaningful. I hope you see some reverence and community and, and the centrality of what we do on that altar uh, through those actions, you know. Anyway, First Communion is great. Um, and uh, so, yeah, one of our uh, one of our first communicants, the family owns the Mexican restaurant, the uh, Silly Serrano. So they had a kind of a nice feast afterwards. I got to take part in, so that was good. Just heighten the joy of the day. Um, let's see. So how many do we have? I think we had twelve, three, and eleven. So about twenty-six. We had our first communions last week. Our confirmations are coming up on Mother's Day weekend, Saturday, May 11th at one o'clock. We still do not know for sure if the bishop's coming, as far as we know he is. That's still the plan A. Um, if he does, it'll be one of his last comfort. Well, no, I mean, he'll probably go out on the confirmation route. I don't know if he will or not, because you know he resigned a little earlier than most bishops do. I think he turned 74 in June, and you have to submit your letter when you're 75. So he's been uh, kind of grinning and bearing it with a lot of physical challenges for the last several years. And uh, the Pope accepted his resignation uh, this year. So now Bishop Battersby will be coming in. I mentioned in the, here's our city bus. I don't know if it's, if it's all day today or, or what the story was, but the bus always goes by St. James. By the way, yeah, if you ever want to take a bus to St. James, the bus number eight, it stops right at the, right at the church. So, I try to do it once a year. I did not do it last year. It's really nice on a snowy day with a big storm. So those buses handle the snow great. Anyway, the number eight came by and it said ride free. So I thought that was great. 
um, so I don't know if it's ride free day or ride free week or you get to ride free all the time. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, but it sounds like a good deal. Uh, I had to do an errand, otherwise maybe I could have taken the bus here. I think, anyway, it's always nice. I used to be afraid of taking the bus. Uh, I grew up walking to school. I walked to grant school, to kindergarten, my only year of public education. That was a good year. This is Koloff. And then I had um, eight years at St. Anne's Elementary and then four years at Newman, Newman High School in Wausau. So, and all those were in walking distance. So I never took the bus. And so I was kind of, you know, you're afraid of things you don't know how to do. And, and uh, you know, we rode buses, of course, to basketball games and things like that, band, uh, band contests. And, but, um, you know, especially, you know, like paying to take a bus and, and uh, you know, just that it was new. So it wasn't until I was after college. It's like, this is what I got to do. I get to get to work, I have to take the bus when I was in Seattle. And uh, I think that's part of what made it so joyful living there. Because um, I learned all this stuff, all the stuff that I was afraid to do, I had to do. And uh, my first year in a big city and, uh, you know, I think it really heightened the joy. So whenever, you know, fears can paralyze us or if we kind of face them and overcome them, it fills us with joy and accomplishment and pride. So try not to be afraid. I'm thinking actually for our next book, I'll have to check it out with uh, the book club regulars. But on May 15th, we're meeting uh, First Belong to God by Austin Iverlay, a retreat with Pope Francis. After that, I just saw a title last night that's got really good reviews. It's called How to Not Be Afraid. You know, what's the most common command in the Bible? Be not afraid. Don't be afraid. It's what angels always say. So, anyway, that might be a good book next time. But, anyway, the bus reminded me of that. But it's a good, I think it's a good point. The best way to deal with fear is to kind of... I suppose it matters on the case. You know, you don't want to just do, if you're afraid of jumping off a cliff, you don't want to do that. But um, so many things, if we just kind of jump in and get involved with what we're afraid with, we maybe find it's not so bad. Or maybe it is really bad, but we ha we will have courage, uh, satisfaction knowing that we, we took on something that was difficult. You know? So, uh, okay, so the blood drive. We got the, before I forget, we got the vine and the branches. Oops. <laughs> so it's kind of a nice image, right? I thought this was so unique when I first saw it. Now I, you know, as I travel around uh, like the Holy Land and things, it's, it's a pretty common Christian icon. So it's it's Jesus the vine and the apostles there are the branches. I'm the vine, you are the branches. That'll be our Sunday gospel passage that we'll hear, you know. I'm the vine, you are the branches. My father is the vine grower. Um, you can do nothing without me, you know, remain in me and I'll remain in you. Uh, stay attached to me, you know, think you can do stuff on your own. And uh, I don't know, I'll be meditating on that this this afternoon with the staff and uh, look forward to that. It's really kind of a mystical gospel. I have to say as a younger man, I kind of resisted it. Like, I don't like being told maybe, uh, without me, you can do nothing. That sounds, I don't even know if that's true, you know. I, and you know like hey i can do stuff not that i'm putting jesus down or i want to i want to live without him but um you know what i mean it's just that visceral reaction without me you can't do anything and i thought well really so anyway there i've exposed my my uh, lack of faith um but those are interesting things to chew on how what does that mean for us without him we can do nothing what what is it that we you know can't do and can we ever do anything without him anyway we can maybe consciously see what's going on that because we have life through him we live you know uh, anyway so jesus the vine where the branches remain in me and you'll bear fruit and the pruning is part of that gospel too whatever doesn't bear fruit is pruned i think even what bears fruit is pruned so it bears more fruit you know so the and pruning stuff it's lost it's clipping it's losing some of uh, some of your some of what makes you the branch, taking some off. That's could be painful. It's like change. Uh, sometimes we we lose things in order to 
weekend things. Right. Um, hey, so let's just make sure I got all these. Registration for Sunshine Days, our Vacation Bible School. I forget the days again, uh, July. It's like roughly July 15th to 19th or something like that. Um, we have a lot of volunteers who signed up. Way to go, volunteers. More than children so far. So we got to get those children registered so the volunteers have something to do, which I'm sure they will. The mission trip to Montana. It's funded through par parishioner donations and through um, uh, fees for people that are going and through the fundraisers like the Chili Feed and other things that they did. It's, it's, it's funded, so a lot of work for Kelly and Beth, the main coordinators, and it's gonna be great. I still hope I can join them. It's, it, if I do, I'd miss the first Priest Unity Days with the new bishop, and so we'll see. I'm actually gonna to get to meet the new bishop the day of his installation, because I'm in this group that's gonna have breakfast with him and his family, and just like seven priests. So I don't know how I get in that group, but, and, um, and him and his family. So maybe I can touch base with him there. And, um, I don't know, it's uh, Ussies, but I, I don't have to decide about the trip if I can go until a couple of weeks before. So, and that's at the end of June. Um, finding the branches around the altar. First communion, 29 years. The kitchen remodel. So thanks for all those who are able to pledge and give to our Inspired by the Spirit Capital Campaign. That was two years ago in the starting and runs for five years. We're going to do a good, I don't know, maybe three quarters of the Rourke Hall project, the kitchen end of it. We won't resurface the floor until more funds flow in in Rourke Hall. But um, uh, we'll get the new appliances and the new floor in the kitchen. And I think the AC, they've been calling for AC in the kitchen for a long time. So that'd be good. Um, so anyway, that'll happen June 4th and they promised to get her done before Summerfest, which is like August 11th. So we'll have to see, we're gonna talk today how we're gonna handle funeral luncheons in Rourke Hall during all that work. So we'll see. Um, and on the 8th, this is the last night of uh, religious education is tonight. And then, uh, the volunteer banquet, all our catechists can, it's gonna be in-house this time, catered by a barbecue place, Carl's, and um, uh, it'll, be, it'll be good. So thanks to all our catechists. I, I've mentioned in church before, and I, I, sh I shouldn't say this, Kelly I think always cringes when I say it, but it was hard, it was really hard for me. And diff different people have different gifts, you know, and uh, doing the, um, before I went to seminary, I volunteered to, take care of the little kids on Sundays, like the Liturgy of the Word for children. I just found it really difficult, but it's good. And I got to know the the families and it helped me, helped me feel part of the parish. In the end, it was a great thing, but I did find it hard. And then as a new priest, I taught like eighth graders or something and ninth graders. And it was fine, but I found it difficult. It's all classroom management stuff is, that's hard. I just, a lot of sympathy for teachers. I hear so much from teachers now that rather, you know, they want to teach. You get into teaching because you want to teach. And so much is classroom management, trying to keep kids attentive and from messing around and how hard that can be. Um, so pray for our teachers. Huh? And uh, I remember I had this one class. Andy was in it and I knew his family and I, he, he sort of stuck up for me. Kids were screwing around and he goes, come on, you guys, he's a priest, have some respect. And they all kind of settled down and listened to my lesson. It was good. So, uh, okay. So where are we at? 14 minutes. Um, so two things I want to talk about. I'll end with the past, talking about the Passover a little bit. And I, uh, I hesitate to share this, but I wrote in the bulletin. I just feel people should know, uh, of ways of getting scammed. So I mentioned we mentioned in church last week and I mentioned we put it on Facebook. A lot of people were getting messages supposedly from me last Monday. It's been going on for years, but it's just a ton of them last Monday uh, asking, saying that I wanted them to give me these gift cards from Apple or eBay or cash or something like that. And it wasn't for me. And most people knew that. I didn't hear anyone who gave the money, but probably there were some given the an amount of people that went out amount of messages that went out. I'm sorry for that. It had nothing to do with us or the parish. Um, but ironically, three days later on Thursday, I was scammed. 
and um, the difference, <laughs> I think I know enough. I hear people getting scammed and I just shake my head and I'm like, oh, that was so foolish. I don't say that, but I was like, oh, that's so foolish of you. And I assume I would never have done that, you know. This, this, what I wasn't looking for and what happened was, it was, I initiated, I didn't get an email, I didn't get a call, I didn't get a text. I was trying to change something on my account for an online merchant and I could not find a customer service number on their website. So I Googled customer service for, you know, this company and a number came up and I called it and they said, hi, you know, this is, you know, and I said, yeah, I got it. I told them, I said, oh, I said, oh, it's okay. So we, you know, we're going to have to verify your identity, you know? So they're asking for all this stuff. And before you know it, I just, why in the world? <laughs> I, I divulged all that information. I, I don't know, but it's been kind of, uh, let's just say their scam was successful. And, uh, but you know, no worries. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I didn't sleep that night just thinking of what a dope I was and reviewing every silly mistake and every red flag that I ignored. Um, but I just trusted them. I trusted that it was, I was talking to the company, you know, and was not. So beware. That's another way you can get scammed. You think you're, when you Google a number, those, there's a lot of fake numbers out there, you know, so that's that's tough and, and uh, as so many people have said that I shared it with it's just pretty darn sad all the energy and time that people give to taking advantage of people and stealing when they could be doing something else with their time right but and but I thought you know got a little better every day so it's been what five six days now so um, a lot of you know a lot of time changing my cards and all that stuff you have to do uh, but spiritually, I, I'm just really grateful for my faith and some spiritual lessons I've learned along the way. I wrote, I wrote down some things that help. Um, just to kind of look at the big picture of life. Okay, what's life for? Is it for me and my security? No, it's to serve God. Can I still serve God? Whatever. Yeah. So, uh, and and kind of to see these challenges as as an opportunity to, I don't know, strengthen faith or, or um, as sort of a test. Do I get, do I get lost in my, uh, my own losses or can I, can I trust that just as Jesus died and rose, I can experience this death and remain faithful and find new life and, and come out of it and, and maybe with deeper compassion for others who have uh, been victimized by scams and and greater solidarity for them, greater um, sorrow that we live in a world where this happens so often. You know, these kind of spiritually enriching um, thoughts and experiences. Um, so, and, and, and sometimes it's always just good. I read somewhere, was it that Eckhart Tolle? He wrote that book called Now. It's like, it is kind of a good spiritual thing. It's like, it's all these things that happened in the past. There's all these things that might happen in the future, but how are you right now? How are you right now? And so just to kind of, just to kind of breathe, it's like, okay, I'm good now. I have people in my life who care for me. I'm healthy. I got this, I got, you know, things are okay now, you know, and I'll just cope with what I can. And that serenity prayer is so beautiful. What I can change, what I can affect, I'll, I'll do, I'll research how to secure these things that may be uh, made vulnerable um, is do what you can and what you can't control you kind of try to let go so but if you you know if you had talked to me last Thursday night none of, none of that was was active I was just just kind of like Whoa. so how could I do that dun, 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 dun. Uh, so anyway our faith does help us keeping it keeping a keeping a sense of the bigger picture and then you know uh, I just had seen The Beekeeper. You ever see? You ever heard of that movie? I think it's just out streaming now on Amazon Prime. If anybody has that, well, it's an action movie, a good action movie. But it's about it's about someone who gets. Um, it's about a, like an ex CIA guy who can do everything, you know, with with guns and his fists, and you know, super superhero kind of guy, but not a superhero, just human being with very skilled, and. Um, uh, and this nice older woman takes him in because he's kind of decompressing. He retires, decompresses from that life. And uh, and then she gets scammed. She was taking care of like 
two million dollars of assets for a, a charity for children and it, it lost it all because of a scam and and she took her own life because she was so i don't know despondent about it and um and then this guy found out about that he goes the bus and he says, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Because yeah, he had all these contacts in the CIA. And blah, blah, blah. So anyway, he just wreaked vengeance. <laughs> he just <laughs> went after the scammers and went all the way to the top. And there's a lot of killing and a lot of this. And, and um, I was always going to preach about this on Good Friday. So, so it's kind of that, that, a story of righteous violence. Uh, of, you know, these are the bad guys. They take advantage of the weak and the vulnerable and the idiotic. And... Uh, <laughs> No, it just anyway, and and disposes of them at the end. So so the the, the good guys win, and the and the bad guys are dead or is suffering a lot, you know. And uh, that's that's Hollywood. Those are stories that make us feel good, but it's not the story of Jesus. It's not the gospel. The story of Jesus is not righteous violence. It's righteous nonviolence. It's. Uh, Jesus allowing himself to be swallowed up by the forces of, of evil and darkness, knowing that love will triumph in the end and, and trusting his life to his God, his Father in heaven, who is love, who raises him, you know. So, you know, not to resort to uh, the violence, I guess, is the... Or, so if I ever had thoughts of, you know, I hope those guys just really... I hope they change. hope they have a change of heart. hope they see... Uh, how wrong it is to steal money from people and take advantage of them. And, um, so, um, you know, but that, it, to want, to try to, just to try to have a Christian response to whatever happens in our life, you know, can really, I think, help us cope with difficult things like that. So, and good friends are great. Love people that you can vent to. And, yeah. So, Anyway, we don't have to be beekeepers. We just have to be Christians. Um, if we're Christian, speaking of which, not everybody's Christian. Look at there's a lot of good Jewish people in the world, and here I am at the synagogue, and uh, and uh, and we hope that they're being good Jews. You know, keeping the covenant with with God. Our, our, uh, they are ancestors in faith, right? A tight relationship between Christians and Jews, which has been tested over the centuries, but um, now I think it's very, very strong. We've, uh, what, mended, mended ways of hostilities, apologized for the sins of the past, and always, always a work in progress, getting along with, with people with different beliefs, but uh, certainly on paper, um, um, we are very uh very uh friendly with uh, jewish people and and recognize the importance of judaism in our world so and so here i am at the temple salome and it's passover week um rabbi jonathan Sachs, famous rabbi i'm not sure if he's still living or not in england he says this about passover the journey from slavery to freedom is one we need to travel in every generation so we were commanded to gather our families together every year at this time and tell the story of what it was like to be a slave and what it felt like to go free. You know, the rationale of Passover. To tell the story of what it was like to be a slave and what it's like to go free. Uh, so it's, you know, I think probably most of you watching this will know the, the story of uh, uh, Passover. It's the slavery in Egypt. And Moses, being commanded by God, I will be with you, and you lead the people to freedom. And, uh, you know, Pharaoh's heart is hardened, and he won't let the people go, and all these plagues come in that God sends, the frogs, the locusts, the boils on the skin. There's ten of them, right? And um, uh, the water turns to blood, and uh, maybe you'll get a chance to see the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston on TV this year. I bet you it's showing maybe this weekend or Sunday. And, uh, um, and then the 10th, uh, the most horrific of the uh, plagues was the death of the firstborn, right? So, and of course, Pharaoh had a firstborn that was going to be a successor in the next Pharaoh. 
and uh, he had to watch him die with sadness. And then I guess he finally relented. And uh, and the firstborn of the of the Jewish people, the Israelites, the Hebrews, were not killed if they took the blood of a lamb and spread it over their doorpost, right? And then the angel of death would pass over that home. So hence the word Passover. And then Pharaoh thought twice about it and just got enraged that that could happen to him and saw the uh, Hebrews leaving toward their freedom and chased after them with their chariots and was gonna destroy them all. And then the Red Sea opened right when the Israelites got there and let them pass through. And by the time the Egyptian army came and they were trying to pass through, the waters came back and they were all destroyed. The chariot wheels got clogged with mud and water. They were drowned in the sea. So that's a great, it's a story from slavery to liberation, you know. And of course that Christian tradition has done a lot with that. In, in symbolism, the waters of baptism, the slavery to freedom, Jesus' own Passover, the Last Supper in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is um, uh, a, a Passover meal. Uh, in John, uh, it's, it's not, um, it's before then, but Jesus, dies on the day that they sacrifice the Passover lamb. And so he is the lamb of God in the Gospel of John. And so just as the blood of the lamb sa saves the Israelites from that tenth plague, so the blood of our lamb of God saves us from our sins. You know, So there's a lot, of, a lot of connections, a lot of tight connections between the Passover story and the Christian story. But sticking with the Passover story, I, you know, when I was in campus ministry, we would try to... Uh, we would have Seder meals. And I'm not sure if we, if, if we maybe should have or not. I, I, it's probably best, um, if you want to experience it, to, to ask around and see if you could ever get a, a Jewish family to invite you over for, because um, it's a day of hospitality, it's a day of welcome. I bet you it wouldn't be that hard. Um, and I know there's not a lot of Jewish people in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, but um, there are some, right? Temple Shalom. And, uh, but we, would, we did these, uh, we had a guide and it went through kind of the basics of the of the Seder meal. It's like you, it's a ritual meal. Like you would, um, you would dip a, a green vegetable in salt water and eat it. And there would be a prayer about, you know, the green vegetable reminds us of the life that God gives to the world and creation. And the, the salt water that we dip it in reminds us of the tears of our ancestors who suffered under under uh, slavery. Same with the bitter, there's bitter herbs that you eat to remember the harshness of slavery. So the, the different foods have different meaning, right? There's the cup of blessing and, and um, drink you know, wine. We always had non-alcoholic sparkling. Um, but you get a little bit of a sense that it's, it's remembering the past and bringing it to the future because we all have that passage to make from slavery to freedom. And, and we all need to remember the past hard times if things are better for us now, then we may remain compassionate to people who are having hard times. So anyway, I read a lot on it. Last, I thought of this because last night I was reading about because of the whole Gaza war and and how that's kind of changed the way that people celebrate the Passover. And um, like in Israel, I think some protesters of the war, uh, uh, Jewish people, and they are having Passover and the Seder meal in front of the prime minister's house. And a lot of the chairs are the... Uh, hostages and so talking about slavery to freedom and they have all these hostages they're waiting to be free it adds a lot a lot of uh, meaning to that right and so of course like anything political there's a lot of uh, uh, different opinions about about it and uh, what I guess I guess what people are afraid of because it happens if people maybe are against this war or against Israel's actions in Gaza um, it can maybe slip into anti-Semitism where you get kind of hostile toward Jewish people, which would just be terrible. I mean, there's no reason you can't be opposed to a, a political action or war, but still, you know, uh, not, you know, not pin that on a, a religion, you know. Um, so I hope that uh, that doesn't catch. But a lot of, lot of protests going on on college campuses that are, being deemed as you know anti anti-jewish 
and then uh, vice versa. And that's just so awful. There's such a horrendous history with anti-Jewish uh, feeling growing and of course culminating in the Shoah in World War II in Germany. So, um, my heavens, let, let's not let, uh, let's not let that go. So, I read a nice uh, article about a mosque, uh, uh, you know, mosque Islamic in Michigan where uh, a guy heard some, kind of a young rabble rouser said death to death to Jews, death to America, death to Israel. And, the, and the, the religious leader of the town got up and said, no, we're for life. We have no place to call for the death of anyone, you know. And so we just need more, more peacemakers, more people standing up for that in our world, you know. Um, I see I'm over time. I think I'm going to just, if it's just too late, turn, turn me off. But there's this part of the Seder meal that I never realized happened before. It's called the Four Sons. I knew there were these four questions like, um, why is this night different than any other night? Or why do we eat unleavened bread on this night? Because our ancestors had to leave. They didn't have time to let the bread rise. So it's unleavened bread, which is why we have unleavened bread at our Eucharist. Um, but there's this other part. It's called the Four Sons. And there's like a, there's like a, a wise son, like a troublemaker son. Um, Oh, what were they? I thought I, I thought I wrote them. Down. Oh, a wise son, a wicked son, a simple son, and the son who knows not how to ask. And they all sort of draw out the meaning of the Passover um, through their ritual actions. And the adults kind of answer the questions and tell more of the story. Like, why do we celebrate it? What does this mean? You know, and um, why why should I care about this? You know, I just want to play my video games. And then there's an answer, a response. Um, anyway, someone. I'll just close with this. Someone. Um, it was kind of like on reformjudaism.com or something. I found this. Some will add a new reading to this year's Seder, which will say, oh, well, I'll just read this. The Passover Seder encapsulates so many of Judaism's most important values. To feed the hungry, to teach our children our Jewish history, to gather our families together in celebration, to imagine ourselves as if we were slaves in Egypt as a way to inform how we treat others. Some will add a new reading this year that will say, in every generation, one must see themselves as if their son, daughter, brother, sister, wife, or husband was a captive in Gaza. Others will sing the Vehi She'amamda, She'amda, which speaks of the end of Jewish exile with additional vigor, drawing a line from the ancient pharaohs to Hamas who come to annihilate us in every generation. You know? But then there's, then there's the other side, right? So they want, then they say, these four, four voices before, for our... For others, the four children will be an Israeli, a Palestinian, a peacemaker, and the one who has no words left with them. The Israeli, what does he say? In this generation, we must all see ourselves as hostages in Gaza, doing all we can to bring them home. The Palestinian, what does she say? In this generation, oh, she says the destruction Dispossession, starvation, and death must end. Ceasefire now. The peacemakers, what do they say? We both love this land, and neither is leaving. We're in this together. Between the river and the sea, two peoples must be free. The final child has no words. They sit silently in tears with two bowls of marar before them. That's the bitter, I think, Bitter herbs, Marar, tasting the bitterness of all, dreaming the dreams of the holy and the broken. And maybe they will all say together at the end, this year we are slaves, this year we are hostages, this year we are hungry, next year in Jerusalem, next year in freedom, next year in peace. May it be so. God bless you.